Let's do this. The cult hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, just a shirt. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Ah, fantastic, Bruce. My uh, rehab of my knee is going very, very well. So I've been dealing with some knee pain uh, for the last three or four months. So it's uh, finally figured out the exercises to fix it. And I feel great because of that. And also some good news today. Not as great. It's really great news in, in a number of levels. Not quite as great as I would have hoped. But Leon Dreisaitl signed a new deal for eight years, Bruce. Um. What's your eight years, $14 million, Bruce? I just give some context to people because I think this is the kind of an important framing of um, this contract. Um, Dreisaitl's contract, when, when we look at um, what star players, star attacking forwards have signed for Bruce on their third contracts, um, these are contracts generally signed when they're between the ages of 26 and 30. And um, in recent years, I've found eight other contracts, third contracts, very similar to, 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 to Dreisaitl. These are players like Austin Matthews, Nathan McKinnon, Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, Genny Malkin, Sidney Crosby, Artemi Panarin, and David Pasternak. I think that it's an excellent group of comparables. <laughs> excellent group of comparables for Dreisaitl. Yep. <clears throat> On their third contracts, Bruce, they, they signed an average age of 27.1 years. So dry settles, is he 29 yet? Um, he will be in October. Okay. So he's he's 28, a little um, older than the average. Quite a bit older, signed actually. Signed eight maybe. years the last time. Mm -hmm. And some guy's third contract comes in their sixth year, his comes in his 12th. The average cap hit was um, 11.3, but that's these these contracts have been signed over time, so the cap was a lot lower. the the key The key thing here is percentage of the cap when the contract was signed. That's the key stat. Mm -hmm. So what Drysaddle is taking um, the cap's now at 88 million. He signed for 14 million. He's taking 15.9 percent of the cap, Bruce. Um, on average. Those players have signed for 15% of the cap. Dry Settle's actually signing more for a higher percentage of the cap than any of these other players. Austin Matthews tied at 15.9%, 15.87. So um, the lowest was Crosby taking, or lowest was Pasternak Crosby. taking 13.6, and then Crosby taking 14.5% of the cap. So um, Leon's percentage of the cap. Um, is this is the richest contract in NHL history, and it's also one of the highest. I think McDavid's second contract was a higher percentage of the cap, but this is a this is a contract which makes Leon Dreisaitl essentially an Oiler for life, which for Oiler fans is great news. But in terms of competing for the Stanley Cup, Bruce, um, the higher percentage of the cap any one player takes means that team is less able to sign other really good players. And Leon has gone out, you know, this this contract isn't a discount contract in any way. It's a very, um, it's a it's a rich reward for an outstanding player who richly deserves it, but it makes it more challenging for the Oilers to be, compete for the Stanley Cup, him signing for this amount. That's my take. What's yours? Now, you're, when you do percentage of cap, you're, you're calculating based on the cap of when the contract was signed and not when it kicks in. Is that right? This was off the old cap friendly numbers, and that's how they always listed it um, on there. So so the the only one I had to work out myself was dry, do the math on myself was dry sidle because cap friendly doesn't exist anymore but yeah these are all that's exactly right bruce this is what not the not the year the contract kicks in we don't actually know the cap what it's going to be next year when this contract it'll kicks be 93 in. is the kind of the the conventional wisdom is it'll be 93 of which 14 would be almost exactly 
point zero percent. Yeah. Man. So so all so, these percentages okay. would go down if you're using it for the year that right. the contracts kicked in. But yeah, um, some were signed a, a year ahead. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Because they're such great players, they, they the teams want to lock them up as soon as you can, and that's exactly what happened with Drysdale. Anyway, fifteen point nine percent of the cap, Bruce. I guess my hope is McDavid signs for fourteen million. <laughs> Year. Oh, nice. McDavid does take a discount, but I don't know. Anyway, what's your take on it? What? What? How do you see it? Uh, well, I mean, as I said back when he signed the last contract, the big number here is eight. He's locked up for eight more years, and you know, in this case, <clears throat> eight years that will be you know on the far end of the. Oops, let's do it this way. I have the career curve, and it's um, uh, it's less likely, you know, that he exceeds the value. Certainly, I mean, it's a it's a nice raise, five and a half million dollar raise, off of what was a, a very good eight year contract at eight and a half million, which he clearly outperformed for at least the last seven of the well, the last six of the seven years that. Uh, have uh, been paid to this point. Of course, there's one more year to run on that contract, and we should celebrate the remaining one year of really value contract of, of Leon. Uh, I wrote a post uh, uh, maybe a month ago. I can't remember the date on this thing. Uh, July 31st, there you go. Mm -hmm. Listing the seven years so far of the dry saddle contract, and the NHL points leaders, uh, Connor McDavid, 834 points, Leon Dreisaitl, 713, Nathan McKinnon, 693, and behind him, a veritable who's who, Kucherov, Panarin, Pasternak, Matthews, Rantanen, Marner, Crosby, Marchand, Stamkos, Barkov, and on we go. Oh, and Johnny Goodrow, uh, number 14 on that list, Patrick Kane, number 50. I mean, that, that's... Basically, you can make a case that's the 15 top attackers in hockey and not be wrong by by more than one or two players. And number two, only two guys have averaged 100 points a year since Leon signed that contract, that being Connor and Leon. <laughs> you know, the Oilers' big two have been delivering the goods on, a, on an ongoing regular basis. Plus, uh, as... Uh, Stoffer summarized, Bob Stoffer summarized, and you included in your post, I believe, uh, not only has he crushed it in the regular season, but also in the playoffs, put up big numbers in the playoffs. And uh, he's, uh, of the top attackers, if there's another one who's more dangerous as both a goal scorer and a playmaker than Leon, uh, enlighten me, who is that? I mean, the guy's had three 50-goal seasons. He's had uh, three seasons of 50 goals and and 50 assists, which I don't think anybody else has more than one. In you know, basically going back to 2010, um, and so he's you know a proven producer. All the playoff all the player cards being put out by folks like Jay Fresh and and. Uh, uh, Dom, the shishin, are, yeah. you know, talking about, you know, he completely crushes it in all aspects of offense, but the weakness is a defensive player. I think I may have heard that from you at one or two points. In that <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned that on this podcast, Bruce, but yeah, that's a good, that's a good uh, thing to say. That's yeah. a good thing. Mika Blake McCurdy uh, points that out. Oh, he too. Yeah, yeah. All the player card. He says, um, Leon Dreisaitl. Signed forever for infinity dollars, is an extraordinary is extraordinary at every offensive facet of the game, average at everything else, an extremely pure sort of hockey player, and yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, don't, I, I, I would dispute I, some part of that. He's good at faceoffs. Oh, he's that. um he's a he's a listen he's a physical powerhouse when he's healthy. And when he's been healthy in the playoffs, especially, like he's just, mm -hmm. we, we haven't necessarily seen that all the time in the playoffs. Um, he gets uh, targeted. He gets targeted and he gets banged up. And when, when Leon is going, he is a force. And um, he's, he, he is a player 
who, when the owners win the Stanley Cup, will will be integral to that um, because he, when he's healthy and he's going, there's just there's few things like that in hockey. Mm-hmm. Bruce, what do you think of? You know, I had been hoping that he would have come in at 13, 13, like that that he w- we would get a discount on this contract. But I see this contract more along the lines of Darnell Nurse's recent contract in, in terms of a player maximizing what he's going to get in his hometown. If Nurse and Drysaddle had gone to market, um, they both probably would have got more. Uh, uh, certainly Drysaddle would, would have gotten more, I believe, than this deal. I don't know if Nurse would have. But um, it's not like the discount contracts we saw this summer from Henrik and, um, let's say, Connor Brown and um, possibly Jan Mark, um, possibly Arvidsson and Jeff Skinner, you know, who, who, who may have taken, let's say, 10, 20 percent less than they could have got in another city. I don't see that. Like, this is about the most you'd want to play a, pay a home in a salary cap system. This is about the highest percentage of the cap outside of maybe Connor McDavid that, you, that you'd want to pay for such a great player. And with Drysdale taking, let's say, 15%, I mean, we've talked about how when you look at um, teams that win the Stanley Cup and that what their top four players get, when they start to get more than, in total, more than 40% of the cap, it's really hard to win the Stanley Cup. This is this is the reality of it, and and I know there's a huge deal of excitement, and I feel it too that he's signed here. I'm hugely relieved and all of that, but when when you do start to get all of these high priced players on, on a team, it becomes very very difficult to compete for the cup, and I, I am concerned about that. Do you have the same thought or concern or? Yeah, I do. What's I mean, your what are you thinking? I mean, next year when Leon's contract kicks in, the cap will probably be 93 million. Yeah. And hereafter, when McDavid and Bouchard, you know, if all goes according to plan, when their contracts kick in, um, the contr- uh, the cap will be closer to 98. That's called 100, just for easy percentages. Well, the four of them are going to add up to pretty close to 50. So call it 50%. And that's a lot. Uh, yeah, that is a lot, Bruce. So the average of the, if you look at um, the Stanley Cup winning teams in the cap era, the average for the top four players has been, the average combined percentage of the cap taken by the top four is 40%. And um, so this coming season, the Oilers will be at uh, 41.2%, which is really, um, the window to win the cup is this year. If you go by, if you put weight in this kind of analysis, and I'm not saying it's the only way to look at the NHL or that it's necessarily a fair and accurate, completely fair and accurate way to, to discern things. But right. so it's, but I think there's something to it. And um, so in Dreisaitl's first year of this new deal, uh, 25, 26 next year after this one, um, if Bouchard, let's say, gets... Um, if Bouchard gets 9.5 million, they'll be at 50% of the cap between yeah. McDavid, McDavid um, or just wait a second. No, they'll have one more year still on McDavid. So they'll be at, um, they will be at 48.7% of the cap for those four players. That's no, a huge they, challenge they, in 25, 26, Bruce, honestly, like seriously to win the cup that year with those guys making that much. So this is the reality of it. And then if McDavid gets a raise, we'll see, we'll see. The cap better go up a lot because um, well, it's capped at, to, at a five percent raise per year. So mm-hmm. you can pretty much say five million a year for the next two three years, while it's around the hundred million mark, and you know be close. Mm-hmm. Assuming that we don't have any more catastrophes. You know, and, uh, you know, civilization changing catastrophes like the COVID disaster that that basically stopped the the cap in its tracks for essentially four years. It never yeah. Worked. And unfortunately, that really decreased what should have been even more exceptional value from the McDavid and Drysaddle contracts. And that the cap, you know, if it had been just 
on its original trajectory, it'd be at 100 million now instead of 88. So I, I think McDavid's contract wasn't like it's Connor McDavid, so it's all like you know he should get 20 percent of the cap. But in terms of what a team is playing for, a, paying for an individual player, it 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 also presented challenges for the Oilers under the the cap the way it was to build a Stanley Cup team. It's just it's just the harsh <laughs> facts of the matter. So if McDavid also signs for 14 million in 20, which would kick in in 26 27. We'd have McDavid at 14, Drysaddle at 14, let's say Bouchard at 9.5, which at this point I think is optimistic. Nurse at 9.3, and that would be 48.8% of um, of a cap that I think would be, um, I think I had it projected at, I uh, can't remember what I had it at. Hey, but, anyway, so, but 14 million on McDavid is also optimistic. Completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah, so it's it's a... I'm I'm excited, Bruce, but um, there is there 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 are the hard facts of the NHL salary cap system. We just got hit in the head with it, man. We the owners just lost Broberg and, and Dylan Holloway. Yep. Uh, um, for they need the money to pay Drysaddle, among other things. Yeah, exactly. Know. And uh, they're going to have to. They're going to have to have a model where players veteran players are willing to come here um for one to two million dollars a year and a lot of them a lot of good players are going to have to want really want to do that Mm -hmm. and i mean other teams have tried that like chicago you know taves and kane were still young players 25 26 when they signed those contracts crosby and malkin were were young um but they signed at a significantly less percentage of the cap than dry settle just signed for like 1.5 percent less so pittsburgh was able to win two cups on their third contracts um edmonton is going to have they were able to fit in a phil housley in pittsburgh for instance um phil castle mm-hmm. phil, excuse me phil castle thank you and um it'll be interesting to see if the orders are going to be able to they're just going to be it's going to be more of a challenge it's just fair to say Best way to put it. I don't well, want to overreact I mean, to it either. Crosby, I mean, he is the absolute tower of guys taking a hometown discount, mm-hmm. constantly signing for eight point seven million per year, even as the cap ramped up, 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 and his percentage of it ramped down, down, down. And I mean, said hats off to him. He uh, he prioritized winning, and because his third contract was eight point seven and not. 12, I think he easily could have drawn 12 that time. They probably couldn't have afforded Phil Kessel. Yeah. And, you know, maybe his um, his largesse, shall we call it, um, uh, what played a big role in Pittsburgh being able to compete further down the roster. And, you know, I mean, Sid is very exceptional. Like, he was well down the payroll list for a time where he was on the very short list of best players in the game let's go and look at what some of the other uh, hockey commentators around the nhl have been saying bruce about the deal this is the athletics dom lachishan uh, leon dreisaitl one of the best players in the world dom says is now the highest paid player in the league a nine hundred thousand dollar k overpay is more than fine for a player who has been one of the league's best values over the last eight years so dom has a model based on various statistics mm-hmm. that he rates the player's value and then he looks at the contract over time right. and he's saying this is a 900,000 um, K overpay. I would have, sh- I would certainly have loved to see Leon sign for about a million less. Um, I don't know if it's going to be an overpay or not. I think Leon's game may age actually quite well, depending on injury. He's a big player. Um, and um, his speed is important. But his puck skills and um, passing skills and his reading of the game, um, I, I could see his defensive play, which has been um, at times good, at times erratic, terrible. Yeah, erratic. His erratic defensive play could could become a lot better. Like that's something he could he could focus on more. We'll see if that happens or not. But I think Leon's game is actually going to age fairly well, Bruce. Um, we may see some really strong production for for many many years to come here. 
I can't see thought? his I can't see his puck protection skills getting you know diminishing mm-hmm. as he continues to gain his old man strength. I mean, he's always been able to protect the puck since he was 18 years old. That was a strength of his, and you know he's a powerhouse at this point, and he'll hold the puck as long as he needs for that lane to open up and then deliver it through the lane to the waiting stick of his teammate, and that kind of that kind of game part of his game should age pretty well and you know the 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 bursts of speed uh probably will become more um what's the word uh selective yeah Uh, but you know the the kind of uh power game he plays i mean one one player i've long sort of compared it's not the same player but they have things in common anza koptar who's several years older than Leon and playing, you know, now deep into his 30s. And he's just remained an effective player really throughout. And his points totals are, you know, diminishing a little bit, but he's still a force. And he's never been the offensive force that Leon is, you know, but he he's, uh, you know, it's not like his game's fallen off as he hit 32, like uh, many power forwards that we see. You know, there's some other comparables, Bruce. Mm-hmm. I would... Like, so going way back, Phil Esposito, um, Joe Thornton, Yaramir Yager. These are mm-hmm. similar stylistic players, some of them with more points than Dreisaitl. You know, Espo and Yager would lead the league. Dreisaitl's not quite in that category, but um, Thornton is a really good comparable. And and yes. those players tended to be... Joe Thornton is might be the best comparison. He's just a very similar. And he player. never came close to scoring 50 goals. He didn't have the shot. Right. Um, but he lasted a long time in the NHL and was a really good player into his into his late 30s. So um okay, here's a spitting spitting chicklets commentator Ryan Whitney. Leon Dreisaitl ain't going anywhere. What a morning in oil country. Elliot Friedman reporting eight years around 14 million per. And this means Connor will be an oiler for life as well. The parade in downtown Edmonton will be the stuff of legends. I I do want to say that um, it was the Two Mutts podcast um, that actually broke this news last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're speculating that it was going to be 14 million. And Kurt Levins of the Cult of Hockey yep. also um, on the weekend also had the $14 million dollars um, pretty much nailed down so can i think uh, kurt and the two months podcast deserves some credit here um but um this idea that um mcdavid is now going to sign at edmonton bruce is became that much less um right. far-fetched it right. became that much more likely right. it's it's not a nothing there's no certainty until he signs but this is really fantastic news. I mean, there's been some stuff circulating about Leafs fans have been circling pictures of McDavid and Austin Matthews practicing together and going to Tim Hortons and mm-hmm. suggesting this is Matthews recruiting McDavid to be a uh, Maple Leaf. <laughs> I, th- I, I think they might want to look at those photos again and maybe um, be a little bit concerned about what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> so I read a uh, counter argument to that that it was actually McDavid uh, recruiting Matthews to be the Oilers. Wait for it, three C. Anyway, like it, at, least, at least we can't uh, no longer dangle the Matthews to Arizona uh, stuff that used to torment Leafs fans. Yeah, and Bruce. You live through. You've been an Oilers fan as, as long as I have, and we have There's been through been no end of suffering with the best players in this city leaving town. This this really is um, the most significant signing in Oilers history, other than Wayne Gretzky's lifetime contract, perhaps. Like I mean, yeah, um, that, that's really, that's number one with a bullet. But the fact is that he didn't stay here for the he twenty one years. He just and, and there's ten of them. And Dreisaitl could ask for a trade too, right? Like he could say, move me. And the orders would essentially be forced to move him at some point. Like this, the players have a lot of power. 
right now. But this is this is a huge like Chris Pronger did, right? He signed a big deal in the long term. But this is a this is super. He, Leon Dreisaitl isn't Pronger. He he is clearly he knows what he's signed up for here in Edmonton. He knows yeah. the drill in Edmonton. Yeah. He likes it enough to sign that long. It is a really great indication for that the orders are going to resign Connor McDavid. And in that way, it's an absolutely spectacular and great day for the orders. And and I've always wanted the orders to to win the cup in part because I've because I I feel Drysaddle and McDavid deserve it. And uh, it would also help them re-sign here in Edmonton. They're, they're, Leon signing this contract um, for this cap hit, for that percentage of the cap, as a he's a full-grown man, adult, making decisions. And if they don't win the cup um, now, it's like, you know, they know signing these contracts for this amount of money um, might have an impact on that. He's got, he, they, they have to know that. So it's, I feel a little less of that. They've got to win a cup for these two guys. Like, we'll see if they win a cup now. I hope they do with these contracts. And when it's it. this year then, isn't it? Yeah, I'd love to see them do it. But on the other hand, like, contract. it doesn't. That's life, right? This is how life works. You know, you, this is the system of the NHL. This is how it works. These are all people making, you know, decisions in their interest. And um, we'll see if they win or not. And I, I hope they do. But, uh, and they've got a, certainly a better chance with Dreisaitl and McDavid. <laughs> that's for sure. But um, the higher cap hit has consequences mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, well, in some some respects, the you know the McDavid Drysaddle tandem harkens all the way back to Gretzky Messier. Yeah, where they have you know the best two C in the league, uh, and when one guy goes to the bench, the other guy steps over the boards. I mean, it's it's not exactly parallel in that uh, Gretzky Messier almost never played together, whereas uh, McDavid and Drysaddle uh, do. You know, 30 to 40 percent of the time during a typical season at five on five, uh, but that actually speaks to well, both guys were pretty multi-dimensional. Messier was the, the first player ever to uh, make the first All-Star team at two different positions, and I think still the only one to make the first All-Star team. Has it? Didn't Red Kelly make the All-Star team at two different? Oh uh, wait a minute. Um, Ovechkin made the first All-Star team at left wing, and then he made it right wing, but both as a winger. Um, they Kelly just had the wrong wing. Yeah, Kelly. Yeah, well, he actually played right wing now, and he had a big okay. year that year. So he, All right. so that was the year he made the All-Star team at both uh-huh. positions because some, some hockey writers still thought he was a left winger, even though he wasn't, and uh, and they messed it up anyway. Um, uh, that's neither here. Messier was the real exception. That was a superstar at left wing, and they moved him to center, and he remained a superstar. And as soon as they went one two with those guys, they started winning cups. And uh, obviously, we haven't quite seen that yet with McDavid and Drysail. But that ultimate powerhouse situation of having two great players down the middle, uh, and we've seen it with. Um, uh, you know, Lemieux and Francis. We've seen it with uh, Sackick and Forsberg. We've seen it with um, Crosby and Malkin. There's been, you know, a number of examples of the t- team having like two two of the very top players, one, two down the middle. And it's been a pretty successful formula over the years. And for the Oilers, I mean, one goal short in game seven of the Stanley Cup finals are all of these conversations would be a little bit different, wouldn't they? Here's from the Colts' Kurt Levins. Kurt says, when Dreisaitl signed his existing contract, I comment, commented, finally, the Oilers are holding on to their best players. And I was attacked by many for applauding such a bad contract. Where are they now? Edmonton once again proves it has become a magnet for elite players. There was, you know, I, I've looked... At the the I I did a Twitter reacts thing social media reacts when Dry Settle signed the first contract Bruce, mm-hmm. and from from people like um like who aren't anonymous who who use their real name who right. comment often on the orders actually the 
the reaction wasn't as negative. I like there was lots of negative reaction from anonymous kind of mm. people on Twitter who, and you know, but from serious people who write about hockey, there was some questions about the contract, but not as much. I think if you look at ex- exactly what was said, there was just doubts, ex- some doubts expressed whether he was going to reach the value of that contract, but it wasn't outrage or anger. Um, generally, no, no, Kurt may have actually got a lot of anonymous trolls attacking him. I don't doubt that, but for more reasonable people, there was doubts by some people Mm -hmm. and, um, but generally speaking, there was, and it was very similar that everyone expected him to sign for a little bit less Mm -hmm. and it was more than everybody thought. And so it's kind of like, ah, I wish it had been a bit less than that, but there wasn't a huge, a huge negative reaction from, um, most people sane people i remember writing up that signing the day it happened i think it was august 16th of uh, 2017 and it was a month after mcdavid had already signed his extension <clears throat> it was the odd situation where even though mcdavid's contract ran a year later than leon's he signed first because as soon as he became eligible after his second season they basically inked him and at that time the story was that McDavid, they negotiated something over 13 million and he took 12 and a half to leave some little bit of uh, bread on the table. And unofficially, it was thought that maybe that was to sort of pay Leon a bit more because he's a big, big man on this team. We need him. And they did pay him a bit more than than uh, conventional wisdom had it at the time, but they got eight years. And the thing about eight years is, well, no one is a guy locked up for a long time, but you're, as a percent of cap, it's going down because the cap's going up. Same yeah. equation. And the player is getting better. And when you get into the late stages of that, they can be a real bargain. I mean, here we are now. Leon Dreisaitl is 28 years old. He's a 100-point-a-year uh, scorer, and he's still getting 8.5, which I don't know where it ranks him in uh, among NHL players, but I doubt it's top 20 even at this point I haven't had haven't huge had. value contracts yeah it's massive value and so it was uh, uh as i wrote at the time the key figure here is eight not 8.5 eight eight years and i got it for both Dr- mcdavid and dry and i thought we're saying that this cup's coming and of course <laughs> here we are it's still no cups but but um We've still got those those two players, and now, I mean, Leon. When you add it up, he's committed to the Oilers for 19 years, and he and Nugent Hopkins 18 years, and they are maybe going to be the first ones to actually play their entire careers as Edmonton Oilers. Fantastic. Pretty significant players to do that. And Oilers fan Rob Farmer had this to say about that. He said, growing up in an era where all the top players left for more money, this feels really good. I will say that Wayne Gretzky didn't leave for more money. He got sold out of Edmonton and uh, wasn't his decision. All right. Um, he immediately got a basically 100% raise from Bruce. He did get a raise, but that's not why. That's not what forced the, the, uh, the trade. That's not what forced him going. It was forced by Pocklington. Wanting more, wanting the millions, not Wayne Gretzky. Um, Oilers fans summit Tripathi. I would rather we slightly overpay Drysaddle than Broberg. That's his comment. Yeah. Um, Fair. Let's see. Uh, let's go. Terry Jones, former uh, Edmonton Journal, Edmonton Sun sports columnist. Terry says a lot of fans got got their shorts and are not worrying. But signing of Leon Dreisaitl was a lock. Eight-year extension beginning in 25-26 with an average annual value of $14 million. Connor McDavid also a lock at this time next year. Dynamic duo for the duration. Edmonton blessed. Well said, Terry. We're certainly blessed in terms of the quality of hockey we've gotten to watch. And I think we can anticipate even as both men progress into their 30s. ESPN is never going to be bored. No, we're not. It's going to be interesting. Like we'll we'll get to see their careers play out, which is fantastic. Like it's it'll make these this this next period. And again, the window this year, Bruce, it's 
it's you know it's a shame what happened with Broberg and Holloway because that would have really helped them this year. I don't want to get into it, um, but um, <laughs> they 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 have a really good team this year and a great chance of, chance of winning the Stanley Cup. I mean, the loss of Broberg on defense is is bad, but Florida won a cup with a somewhat makeshift defense last year. Is the truth? I mean, Florida's defense last year is like the others have Bouchard and, and Ekholm. And uh, if Darnell Nurse gets it together, uh, which we are, which is really the key for the Oilers this year as much as anything, you know, the Oilers have a sound defense as well. Here's ESPN's Greg Wyshynski. Uh, quote, this dry settle contract has deprived us of so many months of, quote, Bruins are keeping one C open for Leon, speculation and fans. Oh, tracking the Sharks so. owner's private plane. <laughs> That's true. They were already, there was already all kinds of rampant speculation on the internet about him going to the Bruins of the Sharks and blah, 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 blah. I think Leon did actually really put it to rest earlier this summer when he said um, that, I think the quote is like, I love being an Edmonton Oiler. I love playing in Edmonton. Something along those lines from Leon. And as soon as he said that, it was like, oh, um, I mean, it's not like he ruined his bargaining position saying that by expressing his deep desire to play here. Uh, but, and it was very, but it was very reassuring for Oilers fans at that point. And then the question is, like, what's what's the number going to be? What's the term going to be? Right. Um, I'm trying to complain about now that we can't worry about him leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Hockey stats analyst Corey uh, Schneider. I believe is how you pronounce his last name. If it's not Corey, you can correct me. Um, he says, might be the best passer in the history of the data set when you combine everything together. I'm not sure what data set. I think maybe. Oh, seven. Oh, no, his data set would be, would be more recent than that. Oh, seven yeah. was the beginning of the analytics era. But uh, Corey's own phenomenal project that he's been doing for years is, is maybe 10 years now. Yeah. Crosby might have a leg up on him from 2016 to 19, though. And, and he continues to 20, 2016 to 2019. Thanks. I don't know how many times three time 50 goal scorers are better passers than they are shooters. Exactly. Dry is while looking like he's intentionally playing with the wrong handed stick with an <laughs> uncaped canoe paddle as a blade. Um, Cult of Hockey special correspondent. Ira Cooper says that's high end four to five year term money for an eight year term that is three post 35 years. That is not a discount at all. And that is a completely fair comment from Ira. That's that's what this contract is. And I don't maybe some people will be mad that we're saying things like this, but um, so be it. Hockey stats analyst Mika Blake McCurdy. Um, Leon Dreis. Oh, I already read that quote. Um, Hockey World Report says you're a moron if you think 14 million is too high for Dreisaitl. Uh, Las Vegas hockey writer Chris Gallick said of the of the term and the cap hit, and I like this: "Damned if you do, damned if you don't." That is completely true about so many NHL contracts. You just Teams are trying as hard as they can to compete. And they often go maybe, you know, that more than the fans and uh, would like and the management would like a little bit more on certainly cap hit or on term. TSN's Ryan Rashog. To me, this deal signifies a willingness by Drysaddle to do a reasonable deal. Certainly not maxing out what would have been there out there in free agency. A massive piece locked in for eight years. And have to think this helps considerably with the McDavid extension this time next summer. That's a reasonable comment from Ryan. I don't know um, what Leon would have got in free agency. I think he would have gotten if he if he had gone that route. Let's say the Oilers had a great year and he had a great year, Bruce. Yeah. Um, he would have been signing a seven-year deal at that point in free agency, and if he went that route. What do you? What would you guess that he might? Let's say he he had a typical Leon season in the trajectory that we've been seeing um, the last few years. What do you think he would have got? 
in free agency if he had just gone for the money. He probably would have got the same hundred and twelve million, but in seven years instead of eight, sixteen million. I agree. That's a that's a that's a that's a. That's just so you know, but he would have been the most celebrated free agent to hit the market in quite a number of years. Like you know, you're talking about all these guys getting locked up. Well, they all got locked up by the by their existing teams, right? And this is the same, like like Austin Matthews took the same 15.9 percent percentage of the cap on the on the the, the cap as it existed on the day that he signed. But Ma- Matthews' deal was just for five years, not eight. So, um, you know, Leon is likely to be overpaid compared to performance as he gets over 35, 36, 37. But the cap will also the cap go up. Will be keep ramping up, won't it? The thing, the, the thing that, I, that, that gets me a little bit is this, that when McDavid and Dreisaitl will be taking the highest percentage of the cap is the same years that the Oilers will have the best year, best chance of winning the cup because that's when they're youngest. Every year, the players age. They're, they're going to get to a point where where they're they're not improving as players. They're going to be getting a little bit weaker each year, based on age, based on aging curves in the NHL. So it's like these these next two or three years are the real window for the Oilers to win the their best chance of winning the cup in a very competitive 32 team NHL where it's really hard to win the Stanley Cup. And um, so the the cap will go up. And they will, they'll be taking less of a percentage of the cap, but that's a really good thing because the orders are going to need it with these two players not being quite as dominant, like as we see with Doughty and Kopitar in Los Angeles, for instance. Right. Yeah. Well, once I get into their mid thirties, it's probably unrealistic to expect cups, but young thirties, absolutely, should be able to compete. Oilers fan Denny Sawchuk says, Maple Leaf fans will take this signing as an indication that McNavid will not sign back in Edmonton when it is obviously the exact opposite. There's no cap space left for him, right? Leon took it all. And well, this is the final comment that I'll read out. It's from hockey scout Dan Tanser. used to be on a, a radio announcer on 630 Ched and a great Twitter account, which I re- recommend following. He says... This was an easy one. As a fan, thrilled to see this. A bona fide Hall of Fame level player signing multiple extensions to finish his career in Edmonton. That's rare and wonderful. Well said, Dan. Bingo. So I think it was Corey talked about the three-time 50-goal scorer. That's a better passer. Yeah. (laughs) Just to harken back to also something I said earlier in in the podcast. Here's the full list of players that scored 50 goals and 50 assists in the same season since 2010. That's 14 seasons now, 12, uh, 11 of which were actual 82-game seasons. Here's the full list. Connor McDavid, Nathan McKinnon, Leon Dreisaitl, David Pasternak, Leon Dreisaitl, Evgeny Malkin, Mikko Rantanen, Leon Dreisaitl. Wow. So Leon three times, five other superstars once each. He really is a fantastic attacking hockey player. His passing is and his shooting, they are extraordinary. What a, what a, a brilliant player Leon Dreisel is on the attack. And he's going to have some interesting wingers this year, right? Like mm-hmm. they really did upgrade for this year. I mean, D- Dylan Holloway. Six swingers, yeah. Dylan Holloway may become a really, really good NHL power forward, like a really rare beast in the NHL. It's a possibility, mm-hmm. but um, he wasn't that last season. He had flashes of it, and Evander Kane was hurt much of the year. And Nuge is um, Nuge is a good complementary player, but he's really a power play specialist. At even strength, he's a he's a good player, but he's not a great player. With um, Arvidsson and Skinner, though, Bruce, you know, we, they may, um, he may really get, so he's got a sniper there and a really aggressive, high-skilled winger. If those guys stay healthy and play well, this could be really exciting. And Kane may be healthy this year at some point, too, and um, combine well with, with Leon. So this could be his biggest year. And if he had had, like, a monster year, you know, if he has a monster this year and hadn't signed a contract, wow, what he could have got in free agency would have been 
maybe even more than the, the six, $16 million a year that we speculated on. Yeah, well, and you mentioned uh, Luge being a power play specialist. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl is also a power play specialist. Uh, in the last seven years, he scored 130 power play goals. Uh, second is Steven Stamkos with 103. Like, you know, there's a big gap there. The Oilers' power play is devastating. And Leon, as a primary finisher, is a huge part of that. Bruce, let's just talk briefly about one other matter. Um, I just have to wait for my uh, computer to call up the story. And here it is. Yeah, Dylan Holloway gave an interview with uh, Andy Strickland, St. Louis uh, hockey commentator, on his Hockey Sense podcast. It was a really interesting interview. And um, Holloway essentially said that the Oilers have known for some time before the offer sheet came that it was that it was in the air that it was possible and here's what uh, holloway had to say quote we knew he's talking about himself and his agent maybe about broberg uh, we knew about the offer sheet before we had any negotiations with edmonton which was kind of weird we were trying to get a deal done i don't think we were crazy we were asking for anything crazy at all if anything, we were very upfront with Edmonton the whole time, even about the whole offer sheet. We explained, hey, this was an option for us. Can we get a deal? And it was weird the way they handled it. I felt I had no other option but to sign the offer sheet. Bruce McCurdy, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, he didn't fill in the blanks of what they were asking for versus what he eventually signed for, which is $1 less than the threshold value. Uh, for the compensation of basically 2.3 million, uh, I can understand why the owners would have been reluctant to give him that 2.3 million. But if he was asking for 1.5 for <clears throat> you know two two years, say, um, they would have had to to uh, you would think there would be negotiations. And I mean, if if what. Dylan says can be taken at face value. It doesn't sound like there were many. I've long maintained that there's more, um, probably a lot more um, threats of offer sheets than ones that ever materialize. In that, if I'm a player, I don't wait for the team to sign me to an offer sheet and force the other club to match. And then the fans say, hey, you abandoned our team for money and you just came back because they match. We hate you now. So players sort of tell the teams, hey, there's this possibility out here. What do you want to do about it? And oftentimes they do something about it. And there may be other times where they trade the guy, which, you know, none of those things happened here. And he went and uh, uh, the more I think of it, the more, you know, terms of these big contracts come and do Leon now uh, Bouchard you know in the same time frame in terms of uh, his contract expires at the end of the season as well McDavid next year paying those kids out of turn um, would have really thrown a monkey wrench in the cap space available that you know I mean I, I like Broberg a lot. 4.5 million is an awful lot of money for a guy who's yet to sort of establish himself as an NHL defender. And Holloway is more of a uh, borderline case in that the you know the salary is literally half of what Broberg's was. Uh, and I thought maybe they'd match that one, but it's. Uh, it's clear their priorities are on those top four contracts and saying we can't afford to be paying everybody two and three and four and five million dollars down the line. We're going to have to find bargains. And uh, and sorry, Philip Broberg, but uh, uh, Ty Emerson is literally 20 percent of what you're going to be making now in St. Louis. And we think he's at least 20 percent as good as you are. And uh, Yeah. It's uh, I would, I would have loved to see Broberg work with Paul Coffey, yeah. and we'll never see what that combination. And he will, he'll never know it either. You know, he might get a coach in St. Louis who doesn't believe in him, a defensive coach. It happens even for players making money. So we'll see. Um, but anyway, I, I don't think it was shocking at all that they the, the, they'd be telling the Oilers there's an offer sheet coming. The, the teams probably hear this all the time. It's probably a standard kind of 
And and a lot of the time it doesn't ever come about. And the players are then forced to sign for what the teams are offering under the RFA system. And, you know, they want, Holloway wants to sign an Edmonton. He wants more money. So, of course, they're going to say, hey, we, you know, can you, offer sheets coming here. Um, give me more money. Right. And, um, you know, from the Oilers' perspective, I don't see anything weird about what happened. Like, it might, it might be weird to, to Holloway that there wasn't more activity, um, perhaps. But negotiation... You know, these are hardball negotiations and, um, you know, who's going to make the first offer, you know, negotiation tactics may seem weird to a 22 year old hockey player, but this is just negotiation. And, you know, the orders are in a cap bind. They, um, they spent over the cap during free agency. They didn't have money to pay extra for these two players. That was the reality. And you can blame Jackson for that. You can blame Holland for not getting um, uh, Broberg and Holloway signed earlier on. It's it's that's both things are fair to do if you want if you, you want to go down that path. But the fact is, they didn't have money to sign either of these either of these players for for the kind of raises that St. Louis was going to was going to give them. If I guess if the Oilers knew for sure that St. Louis was going to offer Sheetham, they might have budged a bit more off their numbers and tried to get them signed, but awfully enticing for both those players to actually wait to see if the offer sheets would come through and they could sign them. And yeah. it's a huge amount of money for both of those players to turn down. I don't, it's, it was, it's hard to imagine it would have gone in any other direction given the orders cap constraints and given um, St. Louis's high offers for both players relative to their value um, as RFAs to Edmonton. You know, if Broberg had been on a team, Bruce, like the orders, let's say the orders in, 2014 15 when Oscar Clefbaum a player very similar to it would have been not surprising at all to see that team with that Oilers team offer Philip Broberg four million five million dollars over six years take a risk take a bet on the player you don't have any you know you're a weak team this is your best young defenseman but this isn't the Oilers right now this is the Blues right now the Blues are where the Oilers were they're they're a, a middling mediocre team They've got lots of cap space. They need players. This deal made great sense for the St. Louis Blues, but for the Oilers, it didn't, and that's why the Oilers didn't match. And I don't think there's anything weird about what happened. I just think that's Holloway's uh, take on it. Yeah, I've made that, and I and many others have made that uh, uh, Robert to Clefbaum comparison uh, many times in the past. And Clefbaum, of course, uh, was even before his third season started in 2016 that he signed a seven-year extension. And at that time, he had you know, un- well under 100 NHL games, similar to what Broberg's got now. Yeah. And the difference was he'd already played his way into the top four. The well, Broberg did in the playoffs. Bro- the Oilers hadn't made the playoffs in 10 years. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, there's a much deeper team and Broberg's had trouble breaking into the top six, never mind the top four. And yes, he did play uh, regularly at the end of the playoffs in a, you know, second, third pairing role, depending on how you parse the ice time. Um, but Clefbaum didn't even play that third year and they'd already extended the guy and it turned yeah. out to be a bargain contract until it wasn't. And instead it wound up handcuffing them to the LTIR ball and chain for three years. And so uh, I'm still aggravated by that rule. Anyways, um, it was just, you know, a different dynamic where where Broberg and, and Clefbaum's development paths were very similar until the opportunity arose for the one guy that just wasn't there for the other guy because the team was in a different place. Yeah. I think they're really good comparables. And so, again, there's probably like 10 teams in the NHL that are really weak, that need a defenseman like Broberg, who have the cap space, who would have been glad to sign him, even for longer term. Mm. Um, I, I, Broberg kind of bet on himself, it seems to me here, by signing for two years. He's thinking he can probably get more on the next deal, which is a good bet. So mm. he was wise, I think, just to sign the two-year deal at that, even though he's could have he's turning down um, millions of dollars. Um perhaps um, in certain uncertainty, but um, 
he's going to get paid, and I think he'll be a good player in St. Louis. And I think Holloway will be, too, uh, a good player. But the owners just couldn't afford him in the end, um, you know, especially with the Vander Kane situation being what it is. Like, not, sounds like he's not going on LTIR. We'll hear more about that he, um, in the, in the uh, weeks to come, I guess. Yeah, one related thing to uh, Broberg that was just announced today is, uh, and this is not a surprise, Tori Krug, St. Louis's former power play quarterback, will miss the entire 24-25 season to recuperate from some surgery or other. I can't remember the specifics. And so the opportunity is pretty wide open there. Like St. Louis's power play wasn't great. And other than Krug and his 13 power play points, they never had any other defender with more than seven. They got a couple of candidates, but right now Broberg is one of the candidates. He did a fine job running the power play down in Bakersfield. St. Louis made a big investment, so they're going to give him a chance. And if he seizes that, then we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised if, he, like on the power play, I could see him, he, he's an exceptional skater with the puck. He could be used in that McDavid role to carry, like as the guy to carry the puck into the zone, to gain the zone, the offensive zone. And what he does after that is more of a question mark. I don't know if he's got great offensive instincts or not. Um, we'll see how he does, you know, passing the puck around the offensive zone and the, you know, that. He can do the, the cleft bomb, I think. Yeah. yeah. Cliff, Cliff was a power play guy, and you know he wasn't like great at it, but he was he was solid, and and you know he moved the puck efficiently from the from the blue line, and I think Broberg can be that guy. And he would have known about Krug. They would probably, I'm guessing, they would have all known about they Krug. Like, about it, yeah, yeah. That heading into this, there it had been rumored um, before. So. so. Yeah, it's a tough loss for the Oilers, but uh, they still, they just got to find the, their Johnny Odoya. They got to find that veteran hockey player at a reasonable price who can come in and play with Darnell Nurse. But again, the right. the key is Nurse. Nurse has got to turn his game around and start better playing better hockey. And um, that's huge. That will be huge for the Oilers if that happens. Right. And what, one other comment back to Holloway. Uh, there was a lot of sort of sym- sympathetic murmuring about uh, Holloway being kind of an unwilling participant that he had to be talked into this double offer sheet. Well, that's over as far as I'm concerned with these comments that he's made. Nothing unwilling about any of that. The reaction to this news in Edmonton was almost universal um, um, disdain and maybe too strong a word, but um, unhappiness with Holloway and good riddance, my friend was the reaction of the vast majority of Oilers fans that I saw after they read what he had to say here. So I don't take it that way. It's just, it's, it no, is a business. But, and um, yeah. uh, was, the amount of sympathy that I have for his situation is he did what he did Bye. you know, that's unfortunate. I would like to see him stay in order, but you know, it was his decision and he moved on. So trying to paint some scenario where he was sort of, trapped into it no he uh clearly knew what was going on for weeks yeah i think the orders model isn't going to be having young players take discounts they might have been forced to take a discount by the rfa system Mm -hmm. uh, by the cb the collective bargaining agreement the way it works but the orders are going to be getting discount players from veteran guys who haven't won a stanley cup who have made more than 10 million dollars already in their career who want to win a Stanley Cup. That's the pool the Oilers are going to be drawing from. And it's not a bad pool, Bruce. Like, there's lots of players in that category. So, hopefully, the Oilers can, uh, can find it. Adam Henrique, come on down. Yeah. Hopefully, the Oilers can find every year one or two guys like that who will sign on and make a difference for the team. We shall yeah, see. And a part of it, what they're going to have to change from their past practices. Oh, this guy came in on the cheap and helped with us. Let's sign him for four years at full market value. And, you know, that's where they, they're yeah. guy right now is with several of these sort of four year class contracts on, on uh, guys who, you know, were value, but the second contract with the Oilers, not so much. And it's instead of, of saying, oh, Skinner had a great year. Let's sign him for six years or four years at 
X million. Let's find the next Jeff Skinner. Who's a guy who's kind of coming down and wants to regain his, you know, his cred in the market, have a good year and then go back on the market for, you know, big, big next contract. Yeah. Indeed. All righty. I suspect that uh, Jackson and, uh, and Bowman might handle that a little differently than uh, Holland did. Yeah, well, success breeds... Winning will be will breed winning, and the, the, if they win, they'll be able, more able to con, convince players to sign uh, value contracts. And um, the success this year, I think, helped this summer getting these players to re-up for less money. And Holland did build a team that went to within one game of yeah. winning the Stanley okay. Cup. So, Bruce, let's leave it there. All right. Thanks for talking today. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime... And in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. I just have to find that.